God calls qualified men to lead His church. But how should the members of the church relate to those leaders? Should elders who preach and teach be treated any differently than those who don't? Or what if a member has something negative to say about an elder? How should, what should the course of action look like then? In today's message, Pastor Knight will explain the prescription for pastoral health in a church. So let's turn to 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 17 through 25. I love that opening because it kind of rattles some of you who have fallen asleep. It kind of shakes you up and you, you say, okay, uh, I'm with you now. We are in a verse-by-verse series through the epistle to Timothy by the Apostle Paul. And so if you take your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5. A word for those of you at home, thank you for joining us by way of live stream. We also want to uh, ask if the church family can remember to pray uh, for the Long family. Many of you are aware um, uh, that uh, their family had contracted COVID and Alex actually had to be taken to the hospital to to get some help. She's back at home now and and, uh, seeking to watch her oxygen levels, Um, and so we want to continue to pray for Tony and Alex and the kids as they recover. We also want to lift up Brigadier Manridge. He's not feeling well. He is so faithful here in playing for us and teaching our youth, and so Brig is not feeling well today. Let's lift Brig up, and there are many others, I'm sure, that are are not being mentioned now who we need to pray for, and so I want to begin by... uh, lifting uh, those in our faith family up who are struggling right now physically, and then we'll come and consider God's Word together. Lord, we thank you for this privilege of intercession. You've given us the right to come before your throne through the blood of Jesus Christ and his life. We come into this place of privilege which you have called the throne of grace where we can submit our prayers to you, Lord, and know that you hear us as we pray according to your will. We pray for the longs, for Brother Brigadier Manridge and so many others in our faith family who are struggling with physical and mental health issues. We just sang that, Jesus, you will hold us fast. And we believe it. Even though our bodies fail, you are holding our spirit and keeping our faith. So we pray your richest blessing upon those who are battling right now. Give them the assurance of your presence and even help them to bear witness in their time of infirmity that you live and that your grace is sufficient. This we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. 1 Timothy chapter 5 is where we are. The series is entitled The Bulwark Church. The Bulwark Church. And we've come to a very, very instructive chapter where the apostle has been dealing with various members in the faith family. Today we come to a section that deals with elders. And the title of the message is A Prescription for Pastoral Health. A Prescription for Pastoral Health. 1 Timothy chapter 5, we'll pick up the reading in verse 17. Follow along with me. The elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. 
For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing. And the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except on the basis of two or three witnesses. Those who continue in sin rebuke in the presence of all so that the rest also may be fearful of sinning. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of his chosen angels to maintain these principles without bias, doing nothing in a spirit of partiality. Do not lay hands on anyone too hastily, and thereby share responsibility for the sins of others. Keep yourself free from sin. No longer drink wine exclusive or water exclusively, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. The sins of some men are quite evident. Going before them to judgment. For others, their sins follow after. Likewise also, deeds that are good are quite evident. And those which are otherwise cannot be concealed. This is God's holy and inspired word. May he bless it to our hearts as we study it today. Lord, may your will be done now in this time together. Give us the ability to concentrate and to receive all that you have for us in this hour. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Well, as a young kid, one of my favorite late night programs was the Academy Award winning gangster thriller film, The Untouchables. Some of you are familiar with that. It was a crime film about how in the 1930s, during Prohibition, where an FBI agent named Elliot Ness was tasked with stopping the notorious Chicago kingpin, Al Capone. Al Capone ruled Chicago at the time, and he supplied illegal liquor. Now, the title for the film was kind of a role reversal, because people believe that Capone's network, politicians and police officers, really kept him well insulated. and No one could really touch him. Ah, that was until... Elliot Ness came along with this team of agents and they raided successfully Capone's operation and the press picked up on that and the press actually named the team the Untouchables. Well, like the Chicago kingpin in church, leaders are often seen as untouchable. Elders and pastors usually can get away with sin and they disguise it as being human or simply uh, they just resist accountability whatsoever. On the other hand, church members uh, disguise their gossip and their nitpicking and personal attacks on pastors and elders in prayer request, they say they're concerned for the rest of the flock, but often they're just spreading innuendo. And when sin in the leadership is not dealt with properly, corruption can fester in a church, and that church can grow sick beyond rehabilitation. When a church splits, it's often like a A crash scene where the murmurs travel throughout the community, where people are giving all their opinion about what took place and 
When leaders crash and when churches split, Satan laughs. The church of Christ suffers a black eye. And some, some people never recover from that tragedy. How does a church hold its leaders accountable? Under what conditions do you rebuke a leader? What is the biblical prescription for having healthy leadership in the church? Well, Paul has been dealing with this issue of love in the family of God. And this entire chapter has been speaking to us about how we deal with each other in a loving manner. Paul has been very clear in his instructions to Timothy about the very tone and the approach that we should take. You recall in chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, Paul began by addressing four groups of people within the church family. Older men, younger men, older women, younger women. And Paul instructed us that as we deal with various age groups in the church, well, how do you approach an older man? Well, the right approach is to approach him like a father, with respect. How do you approach a younger man? Well, the right approach and tone is to approach him like a brother, and that is with a sense of humility. How do you approach an older woman or who may be in sin? The right approach and tone is to approach her like a, a mother, with gentleness. And then how do you approach a young sister in the faith? Well, you approach them with purity. The next group of uh, people that Paul addresses is in verses 3 through 16, and that had to do with the issue of widows. You recall, Paul taught us last week that widows are to be honored. They are to be honored and they are to be supported financially. Now, it first should start with their own children and their grandchildren. And so when a, a, a mother or wife finds herself widowed, the first responsibility of support is children and grandchildren in accordance with the fifth commandment. If that is not possible, the second line of responsibility falls to Relatives. Relatives are to pick up that slack and support. If there are not children or grandchildren or relatives who can do that, then if certain qualifications are met, the church must bear the responsibility and support widows financially. Now Paul shifts to leadership. He shifts to elders, to pastors. And the apostle sets before us four principles to guide us when you deal with those who shepherd the church. And I'm going to give you these four principles in one word each, okay? The first word that he gives to us for how to deal with leaders in the church is appreciation. Appreciation. Let your eyes drop to verses 17 and 18. The elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing, and the laborer is worthy of his, of his wages. Just as God has a special heart and plan for widows, God also has a special work for elders. So how is the church to view and respond to those who discharge their responsibilities rightly? How are we to respond to those who fail? Paul would have us to understand Three factors about elders. And the first thing he wants us to see is that you must recognize their plurality. Their plur plurality. 
Notice he says, the elders, plural, the elders. Who are these elders? Well, they are the same men referred to in chapter 3, verse 3 as, or verse 2 as overseers. Uh, the term elder here, presbyteri, speaks of their spiritual maturity. The word overseer describes their work. And so we're speaking about the same people that Paul referred to in 1 Timothy chapter 3. They are those who are responsible for leading and feeding and caring for the flock of God. These elders are considered to be watchmen, watchmen on the wall, according to Ezekiel. They watch over God's church. They are considered to be stewards over God's house. They are to make sure to feed God's people and protect God's people with faithfulness. And when these elders are operating, they are always mentioned now in the plural. In the plural. We find this in a number of places. Acts 20, verse 17. Acts 20, verse 28. 1 Timothy, chapter 5, verse 17. But I'd like you to turn with me to 1 Peter. 1 Peter, chapter 5. And there Peter tells us three things about elders that we need to remember. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1. Notice how Peter puts it. He says, Therefore I exhort thee, elders, plural, among you as a fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. Peter tells us three things there about elders that we need to keep in mind. First of all, he tells us that there is a plurality in number. Uh, a pastor is an elder, an elder is a pastor, and they are equal in status, they are plural in number, but they are also those who are called then to shepherd God's flock in a diversity of roles. And so when you think of elders, always remember, they're plural in number, they're equal in status, and they have a diversity in their roles. And Peter hits on all three of those notes there. Well, some would ask, why then do they call a, a, a senior pastor, senior pastor? Or he's just a first among equals. But he is nevertheless has an equal status with all the rest. Elders are not figureheads. Elders are servant leaders. Elders are disciple makers. Elders are pace setters. They set the pace for the rest of the church. They are to be an example of strength, of wisdom, of integrity, and they must live lives that are worthy of being imitated and reproduced in every Christian. And so when we think about elders, we must first of all recognize their plurality. Second thing Peter would, or Paul would have us to know is that we must affirm their industry. We must affirm their industry. Back to 1 Timothy chapter 5. He says, the elders who rule well. Now, all elders are to rule. 
And to a certain extent, all teach. But some, in addition to ruling, labor at preaching. That is to say, they expound the word of God to the congregation. And they labor at teaching, meaning that they take time and instruct those who need to be instructed in other settings. He says, those who rule well. Now, when you come to this text, if you uh, read any commentaries on this particular passage, you might find that some people say that this is a reference to two kinds of elders. There are ruling elders, and then there are teaching elders. But I do not believe that that is what the text speaks of here. I believe the distinction is being made not between two kinds of elders, because all elders are to rule and all elders are to teach. I think a distinction is being made between elders who rule well and those who don't. Those who are discharging their duties like God intended and those who are not. Now, if you look at chapter 3, verse, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5, the Bible makes it very clear that all elders are to teach and to take care of the church. There is no division between their titles and their duties. Uh, nevertheless, uh, as you read further in the New Testament, you will discover that you do not find any diversity of titles or roles anywhere where elders are mentioned. It never says in Acts or in other places, these elders have the title of ruling and these elders have the title of teaching. And so this is not speaking of two kinds of elders. But again, it speaks of those who are ruling well and those who are not. Paul says that those who are fulfilling their responsibilities, they're not being negligent, they're not being mechanical about their work, they are not being careless, those who rule well are those who are especially working hard at preaching and teaching. He's describing elders who are laboring to the point of fatigue. Those who are laboring to the point of exhaustion at delivering God's word. Those who spend all their time and their effort in kingdom work. That's the distinction he's making. And just as there was to be a distinction among widows, Paul says there's a distinction among elders and those who rule well, well, they are to be given what? Double honor. Now, double honor could mean two things. It could mean twice as much. Or double could mean a twofold honor. I believe the second is the correct interpretation, a twofold honor. In other words, the church is to not only recognize their plurality and affirm their diversity or their industry, but the church is also to appreciate their ministry, to appreciate their ministry. They are to be given a twofold honor. And what is that twofold honor? I believe the twofold honor is supported by the text. It is not only a respect, but it is also financial support. The word for honor here is the same word that's used to refer to widows in this same chapter, in chapter 5, verse 3, when it says honor widows, the same Greek term. And again, it just simply means respect. Respect arising out of an estimate of their worth. And so that's the first honor that is to be given to elders who rule well, a respect. But then there's a, another honor, a twofold honor, a second honor in the form of an honorarium or financial support. 
Now, Paul uses an argument to support it in the next line in verse 18. He takes this argument from Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 4. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. Paul compares elders who, who rule well to oxen in a field. They are like beasts of burden. There, imagine, if you will, that ox out there in the field thrashing and slashing and, and pushing and pulling under that yoke. He's fulfilling his purpose. He was designed for that purpose. Imagine now that beast needs water. That beast needs uh, uh, some straw so that they can continue to do their job. Imagine the, the farmer saying, no, put a muzzle on him. Don't let him drink. Don't let him eat. He must keep working until he finishes. God says, no, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing. Paul takes this Old Testament passage and he applies it in this setting to say this. If God is concerned that working animals are adequately fed. Well, how much more is he concerned for elders who work like oxes? That's his argument. Now, Paul not only compares uh, hard-working elders to oxes, but he also compares them to farm laborers. The next phrase, notice, the laborer is worthy of his what? Of his wages. He's worthy of his wages. Here in Arizona, we're really familiar with the value and the importance of that back-breaking work that farm laborers extend. You know, if they don't do their job out there in the field with lettuce and tomatoes and whatever else they're harvesting out there, it affects our tables, does it not? It affects us in a very direct way. We enjoy some of the many things that we enjoy by way of eating because of their hard work. And what Paul is saying is this. Just as that laborer is worthy of their wages, so is the elder. And one of the ways that you can show your love for those who carry out that work with excellence and with diligence is to appreciate them. Appreciate them. 1 Thessalonians 5.12 puts it this way. But we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction. And why would Paul start off this section on elders talking about appreciation? Well, because uh, it's very easy for uh, pastors and elders who are laboring at the work not to be appreciated and to feel unloved and unsupported. After all, the church looks at them and says, well, you know, they're strong, they're, you know, they're in the word, they are pressing on for Christ, you know, I'm the one who needs encouragement, not them. No, they need encouragement and appreciation. Now, you know, normally when I come to a text like this, I would have loved to just hand this off to my associate pastor and say, well, you preach it so I don't seem to be self-serving. Nevertheless, in the providence of God, he has us here and we must teach what the Word of God says. The Word of God says very clearly that, that, that we are to appreciate those who discharge their duties as God would have them to. And that can take the form of words. It could also take the form of some tangible expression when appropriate. This is not the pastor trying to ask for money. I'm just telling you what the scripture says. Are you with me? 
This week was a particularly challenging week for many of you in the church family as I've talked with you and prayed with you privately. And it was also a particular challenge for me for the warfare never stops. And I happened to be going through some books on my shelf and noticed that I had a little photo album that was stuck on my shelf. And I pulled it out, a little gray one, and I was surprised. I had forgotten all about it. It had been given to me on the 25th anniversary of the church, and it had notes from all of you to Mary and myself. And as I read through those notes, I was encouraged. I was encouraged to, to press on, to keep laboring. God used that encouragement through words to build my spirit and give me a little bit more energy to keep pulling the yoke. It does work. That's the reason for the illustration. Now, Paul turns his attention from good elders or good pastors who deserve appreciation to bad ones, bad ones who deserve to be rebuked. So how do we, how do we deal with those elders who fail or who are accused of failing? The second principle is this, fairness, fairness. Now follow with me in verse 19. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except on the basis of two or three witnesses. Those who continue in sin, rebuke in the presence of all so that the rest may also be fearful of sinning. Now the situation that Paul is envisioning could be something like this. Timothy has just finished preaching a message on Sunday morning. He steps down out of the pulpit, and someone from the church comes to him. It's a member of the church, and they say softly, Pastor Tim, do you have a moment to talk in private? Absolutely, absolutely. Let's step over here just for a moment. What's on your heart? Dear sister, well, she says, well, Pastor Tim, I don't want to get anyone in trouble, and I've prayed about it. I just can't find any peace, but I thought I would come to you. I'm concerned about what people are saying about Elder Ruggles. They, they think he must be doing something shady because he travels so much. I know he's not rich. But I don't understand how he's able to, to travel so much. It's so expensive. I've just gone on a trip, and I know how expensive it is. How is he able to take all these trips every year? He must be up to something. Pastor, I don't know what to do. I thought I'd come to you and get some direction. This is an example of a complaint or an accusation that could be made against an elder and what we ought to do about it. Now, Paul gives Timothy and us two directions, and both of these directions complement each other. First, when an elder is accused of something, he must be dealt with in a certain way. And then when he is guilty of something, he must be dealt with in a certain way. So first, verse 19, Paul tells us we must refuse to entertain frivolous accusations. We must refuse to entertain frivolous accusations. Verse 19, do not receive an accusation against an elder except on the basis of two or three witnesses. We must be very careful in how we deal with a man who occupies a pre prominent place in the church. Why? 
because sometimes people with personal animosity, sometimes people with um, some type of agenda is seeking to damage the elder's reputation. They're seeking to undermine his authority as a leader. The word accusation here is an interesting word. Would you underline it in your Bible? It is a word that is associated with the word agora. The agora was the public square or the forum in the Greek world. We see such a place in Acts chapter 17. Uh, you remember when Paul was waiting for Silas and Timothy, we're told by Luke that Paul's spirit was provoked within him because in Athens, the city was full of idols. Uh, Paul had a pattern that he would follow. That pattern would be, we would go to, first of all, the synagogue and preach to the Jews. And then after he preached to the Jews, he would go to the marketplace. He would go to the square and minister to the Gentiles. In Athens, the Areopagus was that place. It was called Mars Hill. It was where people went to hear all of the little juicy tidbits of gossip and, and, and barbershop philosophy. They would gather and hear all of that stuff. Paul took that opportunity. He went into that square. He preached Jesus Christ and the resurrection. Then Luke tells us this. In Acts chapter 17, verse 21, Luke says, Now all the Athenians and the strangers visiting there used to spend their time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new. In other words, this was a place where no one was concerned about truth. No one was concerned about God's will. They were just gossiping. Paul says, listen, let's not follow the world. When such accusations are made, they must not even be entertained. They must not be received. Why? Because if falsehoods are being given, it violates the ninth commandment, which says, thou shalt not bear false witness. That commandment forbids everyone from slandering a man's character or slandering his reputation. Thomas Watson suggested that prominence in the church is often attacked by slander and that holiness is no shield from it. Christ was the most innocent man upon the face of the earth. And yet he was slandered. He was called a gluttonous man and a drunkard. John the Baptist was such a godly man who lived an austere life. And yet they said that John the Baptist had a demon. When we accuse someone of something without examining the facts, we imitate the devil. The devil is called the accuser of the brethren. Same term. Augustine reminds us that the tongue inflicts greater wounds than the sword. In other words, you, listen, you can strike somebody down without even touching them, just with words. So Paul teaches us here that just as it is a sin against the ninth commandment to raise a false report, it is also a sin to do what? To receive a false report. So Paul says, refuse to entertain unsupported accusations against anyone, especially an elder. Oh, I could hear someone saying, but pastor, what about if the elder is guilty? Paul says, when such accusations are made, they must not be entertained unless supported 
by the testimony of two or three witnesses. In other words, we must be fair and we must only deal with facts. We must be fair and we must only deal with facts. That's number two. This is the standard of scriptural justice both in the Old and New Testaments. That there must be two or three witnesses to sustain a charge and even to secure a conviction. God set it up this way so that one man could not come and simply give a lie and it would condemn another man. Here's my proof. Deuteronomy chapter 17 verse 6. On the evidence of two witnesses or three witnesses, he who is to die shall be put to death. He shall not be put to death on the evidence of one witness. Deuteronomy 19.15 A single witness shall not rise up against a man on account of any iniquity or any sin which he has committed. On the evidence of two or three witnesses, a matter shall be confirmed. You see the same principle in the New Testament, Matthew 18, 2 Corinthians 13. What's the point here? The point of two or three witnesses does not mean that two or three witnesses must see the act. But what it means is that after these two or three witnesses examine the accusation, assuming that they're all trying to find the truth, you must protect an elder's reputation. Don't receive it. If a person comes to you with this accusation and they don't have facts to support it, you are to say, I don't want to hear that you're damaging this man's reputation and you should stop. They say, Pastor, I know it's true. You say, who else saw it? No one else saw it. What is the proof of it? Here's the proof. Then two or three, two or three witnesses come and examine the proof. And if the proof is legitimate, then it's dealt with. If the proof is not legitimate, then you all are to say to that person making the accusations, you must stop. You're damaging the elder's reputation. You're undermining his authority. You say, Pastor, what if he's guilty? What if we examine the evidence and yes, he is guilty? What does the Bible say? Verse 20. Those who continue in sin rebuke in the presence of all so that the rest may be fearful of sinning. Now these verses right here, verse 20, can go in one of two directions. First of all, it could speak of the one being accused. If the one being accused is guilty because someone has gone to him privately and called him to turn away from his sin and he did not turn away from it, and he continues in sin, now it, it's to become a public thing. So the admonition is, he has been approached privately by these two or three witnesses and given a chance to repent. The present tense seems to indicate that this person rejects listening to those witnesses, and he continues in sin, and therefore... Now, even in the face of proof, he is denying it. So now he must repent or be publicly rebuked. Now, I must slow down just for a second and try to labor here. I want you to understand me clearly without belaboring the point. Private sins must be dealt with privately, and public sins must be dealt with publicly. What is a private sin? 
a private sin would be a sin that is perhaps a part of a person's sanctification process like unrepentant, like anger or dishonesty, depending on what, what the dishonesty is about. Say a, a particular elder is seen to be angry and he's unrepentant in that anger or he's dishonest. You have to go to that elder and that's to be dealt with privately. However, there are other sins that would be considered public sins, scandalous sins. What kind of sins are those? Those are disqualifying sins. Those are sins like adultery, embezzlement, sexual abuse, or some crime, some legal crime. Now listen, the Bible gives no room for scandalous sins to be kept private. We witnessed that in the Catholic Church when these priests were abusing uh, kids. The Bible gives no room to keep that private. That would be considered a public scandalous sin that should become public right away. But there, but there are other sins that should be dealt with in a private manner. And uh, say, for instance, an elder is dealing with a member and he says something sharp and causes pain. And he said it out of anger. And then that is brought back to the elder's attention through witnesses. This elder must be confronted about that privately and given a chance to repent. And if he repents, the Bible says you've won your brother. You don't need to now take that sin publicly and say, well, you know, he spoke out of turn, yet he repented. You don't need to take that publicly. You need to treat him just like Matthew 18 would teach us to deal with every brother or sister. But those who continue in sin, they must be dealt with. Now, that's one direction, the accused. How about the one making the accusation? I think this verse could apply to the ones making the accusation as well. If the ones making the accusation have no proof, and it's been examined, and they continue to slander the man's character, they are to be rebuked so that people don't keep sinning against an elder by attacking without facts. Because that can cause problems in the church. Now I've labored at this point all to say this. Paul is instructing Timothy that you must not listen to frivolous accusations and you must refuse you must refuse to hear those accusations if they don't have support but you must also refuse to overlook serious sins deal with things fairly timothy be cautious about accusations, but be bold in rebuking. I wish this, uh, in some sense, was a Bible study where I could stop and say questions, comments, thoughts, but we're rolling here. Number three, impartiality. Impartiality. How do you deal with elders? First, appreciation. Second, fairness. Third, impartiality. Verse 21, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God, that is, the living God, the Father, the mighty maker of all things, and of Christ Jesus, he who is the eternal Son who became a man who lived a perfect life, who died a sacrificial death, who rose from the grave, who ascended and is at the right hand of the Father now. 
I charge you in the presence of God the Father and God the Son and of his holy angels, his chosen angels. Why add angels here? What Paul is doing is he is clustering all of this together, God, Christ, and the angels, because that is the combined authority of heaven. I am solemnly charging you like a soldier standing in the presence of God, as is the apostle, to maintain these principles without bias. In other words, Timothy, you must not do this with prejudgment, and you must not show favoritism. You can't jump to conclusions about anyone's guilt or innocence. You can't play favorites, Timothy, when dealing with church leadership. We live in a society, don't we, that uh, gives preferential treatment to anyone or to many people and ignore others. If you're rich, if you're uh, gifted, if you're intelligent, if you're beautiful, you can get preferential treatment. But if you're not, well, you can be overlooked. And Paul says, listen, Timothy, you need to do this, and you need to treat people for who they are in Jesus Christ, not how they look or what they have. Don't play favorites, and don't be partial. Do this without fear, Timothy. Do this without favor. Do this without prejudice. Do this without partiality. Be firm, be open, be fair, be biblical. And so this is how we deal with elders, church. Appreciation. We're to also be fair. We're to be impartial. Finally, he says, now here's some caution, Timothy. Here's caution. Verse 22, don't lay hands on anyone too hastily and thus share for the responsibilities, uh, share responsibility for the sins of others. First caution, Timothy, don't rush to ordain someone. To lay hands on someone was to publicly identify and authorize that person as a leader. That's what happens when we ordain elders and deacons. We place our hands on them and say to you all, we have examined their life, they are worthy of your trust, and you can follow them. It's kind of like putting a seal of approval on a person. Paul says, Timothy, don't rush. Don't rush to do that. Take your time, Timothy. Why? Because if you ordain leaders too quickly or haphazardly and some unqualified person comes into the ministry where you're going to share responsibility for their sins, the sins that they uh, act on that cause trouble in the church. And this could refer to past sins or even future problems because you suddenly appointed a person who was not qualified. So he says, Timothy, don't rush. Take your time. That's the first caution. Second caution, keep yourself fit. Keep yourself fit. Keep yourself fit. Free from sin. No longer drink water exclusively, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. Timothy was to exercise caution, not just in being careful to ordain people, but he was also to address his spiritual and his physical needs. Listen carefully to this. Paul is saying, first of all, Timothy, keep yourself free from sin. Take care of your spiritual life. Paul is championing, being a champion for the health of Timothy's soul. 
Sin is always trying to entangle the man of God. And so the man of God must continue to fight away at the weeds of sin. He must deal with his own heart regularly in sanctification. Like John Owen said, you must be killing sin or sin will be killing you. And the leader must always, always, always keep fighting sin in his life. But notice now, Paul is not afraid to address the care of Timothy's body. He says, Timothy, don't don't drink water exclusively. Use a little wine for the sake of your ailments. Now, why would he tell Timothy that? Clearly, Paul is concerned about Timothy's health. And we can take from this passage that Timothy had taken a route of just drinking water exclusively. Perhaps he was doing this just to say, I don't want to be associated with the ills of society. And so I'm going to simply drink water. But remember, water in the Roman world was unsafe. Water in the Roman world was a carrier of disease. And so when Paul says no longer drink water exclusively, he is saying, Timothy, you've been insisting on drinking water only, and you're putting your own health at risk. Timothy, I know you're trying to set yourself apart from the ills of society, but Timothy, you must take care of yourself. And so he gives him two stipulations to preserve him from misuse. He says, use a little wine. So he speaks of the the quantity, a little wine. And then he says, you use this little wine for a particular purpose. What purpose? Not for relaxation, not for recreation, but because of your stomach problem. So he tells Timothy, listen, just drink a little, not to relax, but to deal with your issues physically. Why? Because, Timothy, if your body quits, what you'll find is that you can't fulfill your ministry. So you got to take care of your health. Listen, people, uh, medicine is not the enemy of faith. Are you all hearing me? Medicine is not the enemy of faith. God has given skilled doctors, skilled pharmacists, skilled nurses, skilled surgeons to treat the body. Now, some medicines can be abused. But there is no reason to stay away from those who are skilled in treating the body. And may I add that exercise isn't faith's enemy either. Take a walk. Do a little workout. The more spiritual you get, the more you should desire to be a good steward of your health. No amens there. The closer you get to God, the more you're going to want to take care of the temple because it is the place in which the Holy Spirit dwells. And so Paul gives Timothy a great balance here, great balance that deals with wholeness. Timothy, take care of your spiritual health and your physical health. That's The second caution, don't just labor in the ministry and don't take care of yourself. I did this 15, 20 years ago. I was working so hard, so hard I was neglecting my family, I was neglecting my health. There was probably only one time where I missed preaching in this pulpit and it was because I woke up on a Saturday night and could not move my arm because the nerves in my neck had become pinched. And I had to call Andy last second, and he preached a wonderful message. But my health was just not being taken care of. And from that point on, 
I said, no, I, got, I, I, can't, I can't do this. I got to take care of my physical health and my spiritual health because they both go together. This is a, this is a principle for all of us to apply. Here's the last thing that he says to Timothy. Timothy, when you are dealing with elders, you must exercise discernment. And we'll close in verse 24 and 25. Exercise discernment. He says, the sins of some men are quite evident. They go before them to judgment. For others, their sins follow after. Likewise also, these that are good are quite evident. And those which are otherwise cannot be concealed. Timothy, he says, I want to give you a contrast between sins and good works. And I want you to keep, in two, th keep two things in mind about sin and about good works. Timothy, remember, sins can be of two kinds. They can be open, and some sins can be hidden. Open sins are quite evident. He, he depicts them as, as running ahead of a man's assessment or evaluation. They clearly tell you that this leader is this kind of person. Or this potential leader is this kind of person. But he says some sins are hidden. You don't see them at first. They, they follow after like a runner in a marathon race. And because of these hidden sins that trail after, Timothy, you can reach a decision. And you don't have all of the evidence. But it's going to come. Just like that last runner coming into that arena, it's going to come, Timothy. You just got to be patient. Don't rush. Paul's counsel here is very wise. And he says, Timothy, I don't want you just to look for disqualifying sin. Timothy, I want you to also look for good works that are plain. We look at a person and we just say, is there anything wrong? No, there's nothing wrong. You're qualified. Paul says, don't do that. Paul says, ask another question. What's right? Where are the good works? Likewise, he says, good works, they will rise to the top. They will show you what a person is about, but there are other good works that they don't come to the top so quickly, but they're going to come later as well. And those that are good, they cannot be hidden, Timothy. They will come to light. So in this closing verse, Paul just encourages Timothy and us, don't be fearful of missing out on qualified leadership. Time will tell. Take your time. Refuse to rush. Take care of your own spiritual life so that you can operate with the right kind of discernment. Here are the principles for pastoral health. Number one, appreciation. Number two, fairness. Number three, Impartiality. And number four, caution. Caution. As we close our time out, I want you to know that God cares about your accountability. He cares about your ministry. He cares about your soul and your body. And God cares about your leaders. God cares about your leaders. Do you? Let's pray. Lord, as we have uh, labored to make sure that we are clear about what your word says, it has been uncomfortable like going to the doctor ourselves. We are afraid of what the doctor might point out, and so we hesitate to go, but we know it's necessary because we want to receive a good bill of health. Lord, help us 
as a church to embrace, to embrace your divine prescription. Lord, we don't want to be one of those churches that crash and burn because we are not listening to the word. So I pray that you would take these truths, cause them to penetrate deeply into the souls of both leaders and members. And together may we say, O oh Lord, you are so wise and you are so good. And we thank you for your instruction. We come under your authority and we will do your work your way. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening to another sermon at the Church of South Mountain. Today's message was a prescription for, for pastoral health out of 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 17 through 25. Pastor Knight, thank you uh, very much for the message today. Uh, b before I ask my questions, I just want to say I appreciate you preaching this message, even though I understood that, uh, as you made clear in the message, it makes you uncomfortable. But the man of God who will not shy away from any topic that's in the Word of God, I think, is an encouragement to every member of that church. So I appreciate you pushing through and, and delivering the Word of God uh, as, it, as it presented itself today. So a couple of questions for you. This passage has uh, a couple of pieces, at least, that are commonly misunderstood and or debated. And the first one is the meaning of double honor. So I, w I would like you to talk more about that. You, you said the double honor really is not extra honor, but more it's two distinct pieces of honor. So talk to us more about how you came to uh, believe that that's really the right way to understand these. Well, well, first of all, by just looking at the words, and double can just mean twice. And so if you would look at the context and ask, well, does Paul mean that an elder is to be given twice respect or double respect, um, that doesn't seem to fit the, the context. But the next verse actually helps uh, clarify, I think, the interpretation when he grabs the passage from Deuteronomy 25. And so I simply believe it means respect and support or honor and an honorarium. And yet, of course, as you know, that, that doesn't mean that every elder is to be given an honorarium. Uh, some do not need an honorarium or support because they earn that living in the world. Uh, but there are others who have a unique calling to preach and teach who are part of that elders team. And they're the ones who are to be supported. Okay, all right. Thank you for that. Um, so the second one has to be with the witnesses, and uh, this one surprised me because you made the point that they don't have to be eyewitnesses of the particular accusation that's being made. Talk to us a little bit more about how you came to understand that. Yeah, well. because when you think of the practical application, if, if someone accused you of something and they said, well, um, uh, we said, well, do you have any support for that? And this person, no one saw it, but there's still proof of it in some way. Well, that's what the witnesses would need to look into, the, the proof of that accusation. So again, it doesn't imply that one has to be, has to see something, but that there simply must be credible, collaborated facts before it goes forward. And so if you, if you restrict that to just people who see it, um, then I think you're going to misinterpret the whole issue of justice in, even in the Old Testament. Uh, the Old Testament encourages investigation into matters. Um, and if there are no witnesses still, how can that accusation be collaborated? And if it can't be, we're not, we're not just going to take your word over another person's word and condemn them. And I think that's a safeguard for justice that God set forth in his word. Absolutely. Completely under, understand what you're saying. You certainly will have many situations where there isn't any opportunity for other people to be present uh, for the, the deed that was uh, 
uh, the, the man of God is being accused of. Mm -hmm. But if there is other evidence, we're not to ignore that other evidence. That's right. So we, you need to bring in outside people to take a look at that evidence That's and make right. a determination uh, to try to bring about justice, as you said. I, I, mm -hmm. I do so appreciate that. That's what we do in courts, right? Yeah. You have export witnesses. They're not witnesses to the act itself, right. but they can tell you, well, based on the evidence that we looked at, we can tell you we know this, we know that, we don't know this. Yes. Same thing should happen in the church. Very good. Very good. And don't you just love God's Word for its balance, yes. for its uh, practicality? Yes. If we were to follow and are to be the kind of church God would have us to be, we must take this Word seriously. It's so easy for the enemy to attack leaders and soil their reputation and undermine their leadership in the church. God says, no, this is how you deal with it to protect those men while at the same time not ignoring issues that might be there that you need to deal with. I, I so appreciate that because, uh, because it is very easy to take the first part of Paul's uh, message here about giving uh, elders who work hard double honor and just use that as an occasion for sweeping everything under the rug, mm -hmm. um, which certainly we know that's happened in the Church of God around the world. Yeah. Yes. Um, so praise God for the Word of God. Again, thank you so much for joining us today and look forward to you joining us next week for the next sermon.